Good morning, everyone. My name is Janet Bruff, and I work for the Georgian Bay Land Trust. And did you know that today is the flight of the Monarch Day? So we're really happy that you're all here with us today to celebrate this special butterfly. We have two experts with us today, Dr. Ryan Norris and Jessica Linton, who will be telling you all sorts of cool and neat things about monarch butterflies in just a moment. If you have any questions, please uh, type them into the chat box and we will get to them at the end of the presentation. I wish to thank Mark Payne and Payne Marine for sponsoring this series. Payne has been serving the Point of Barrel area since 1961 and is a supplier of Yamaha outboards and Scott Hunt and limestone boats. So please visit paynemarine.com at your convenience. So, here we go. I'm very excited to Ryan Norris and Jessica Linton. Ryan is a ecologist interested in the behavior, population dynamics, and conservation of animals in seasonal environments, with a particular emphasis on migratory birds and butterflies. In 2019, he began a cross-appointed position as the Weston Family Senior Scientist for the Nature Conservancy of Canada. Ryan, in this new role, will develop and lead the new Weston Family Conservation Science Fellows Program, supporting conservation leaders of the future. And Jessica Linton, well, butterflies are Jessica's business. Jessica is a consulting biologist who specializes in butterflies. Based in Ontario, her work has a very heavy focus on species at risk, including butterflies. She's over 10 years of experience in conducting butterfly surveys, behavioral monitoring, and migration studies. Jessica has also lived in Costa Rica, where she worked as a guide and later as manager of the Monte Verde Butterfly Gardens. So I'm now going to turn it over to Ryan and Jessica, who will teach us all sorts of new things about monarch butterflies. Over to you. Thanks, Janet. Well, I, I, th I think I learned a couple things about Jessica there. I didn't know she, <laughs> I didn't know she was the manager uh, of the Monte Verde Butterfly Gardens. <laughs> Um, oh, well, that's fine. Let's just know we're all here, and when the timing is right, uh, we'll pick up. Okay. Um, so we've got, uh, we'll just do a short little presentation, and then uh, we're happy to take questions. Janet, how much time do we have? You've got 30 minutes. 30 minutes, totally. great. Perfect. It's lovely. It's just... <laughs> It's just terrific. So it's it's terrific, and we see it's awesome. No, everyone sees so the mute themselves oh, yes. unless you have a question. Very nice I'm story. Just, so, um, we'll try to let, let that happen. That. That'd be great. Are the out? Somebody's got their okay, microphone um, on. Sorry about that. I've changed. The participants now are no longer able to unmute themselves. We'll just take questions at the end. Okay, so perfect. Go ahead, Ryan and Jessica. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to share. Um, I'm just going to share my screen here. Oh. Hmm. I think. Yeah. Maybe um, you want to share just your screen at, at that one participant can share. We might have to be. Oh, there we go. Okay. There we go. All right. So Janet uh, kind of covered uh, who we are. Um, Jessica's a, Jessica is a senior biologist, a consultant with a, uh, with a firm in Waterloo, Ontario. And on the side, she leads uh, tours um, down to Mexico to see the overwintering monarch butterflies. Um, she didn't do it this year, obviously. And unfortunately, She's not doing it next year either. It's already been canceled. Um, however, 2022, if you're interested to go with Jessica down to uh, the overwintering sites, it's a fantastic trip. And um, she'd be happy to talk to you about that as well. I'm, uh, as Janet said, I'm a professor at University of Guelph and I'm the senior scientist for Nature Conservancy of Canada. Um, I guess in some weird way, maybe a competitor with Georgian Bay Land Trust, but I, I think they kind of stay out of each other's hair. Uh, and uh, I'm happy to do this. I've done a few talks with Georgian Bay Land Trust now, and this is this is our first uh, 
talk geared towards kids. So Janet asked us to talk about some monarch, monarch butterfly work. I've been working on monarch butterflies for um, over 10 years now um, on scientific, various scientific projects. And Jessica has been also, um, in addition to our tours, also been doing a lot of work um, on monarch butterflies. So Jessica, take it away on the life cycle. Sure, thanks Ryan. So I'm just gonna talk a little bit about the monarch butterfly life cycle. Uh, it's probably one of the most famous life cycles that people are aware of. Um, all, like all butterflies, monarchs have four life stages and they go through a complete metamorphosis, meaning they change completely in their form throughout their life cycle. So the first stage of the monarch butterfly life cycle is the egg. And female butterflies lay their eggs on milkweed plants. You can see uh, a tiny little egg there. They lay their eggs individually, so one at a time. And most eggs will hatch just after a few days. Um, and what emerges is a caterpillar or a larva. And the larvae um, are very, very tiny when they're first born. And their job basically is to just eat. So they spend their entire life eating and they can more than eat more than double their body weight in one day. Um, and the really neat thing about caterpillars is that their skin um, is a set size. So the caterpillar eats and eats and eats until he is so fat he can't fit inside his skin anymore. And then he takes his skin off and underneath is a big, um, a looser skin underneath that he grows into. And caterpillars, monarch caterpillars will do this five to six times throughout their life cycle. Um, and when they're finally done their eating stage and they've grown to be a nice big fat juicy caterpillar, um, they shed their skin for a final time. And instead of a loose caterpillar skin being underneath, there's actually something called a chrysalis underneath, which is pictured there on um, the far right hand side of the screen. So monarch chrysalis are a light pale green color with beautiful gold uh, dots on them. And at this stage of the life cycle, the caterpillar will actually transform into a butterfly. And um, that process can take anywhere from a week to two weeks, depending on weather conditions. And when the butterfly emerges, you can see at the bottom of the screen there, um, it's got about 30 seconds to get out of its chrysalis because its wings are all scrum scrunched up and wet and um, it'll pump all this fluid from their body into their wings and expand out. And then they hang there and dry off like wet laundry for a few hours and then they're ready to begin their uh, life as a butterfly. Oh, I'm just trying to get the, there we go, whoop. And, so, so we spend a lot of time as a family uh, raising monarch butterflies, uh, which is a great activity you can do as a family. Um, usually the kids will go out and check milkweed plants for either eggs or larvae. You can see Sawyer there on the far left hand side, uh, found quite a few monarchs one day on one plant. Um, and it's a pretty, as long as you have a supply of milkweed, um, you can raise butterflies at home with your family. They just need fresh milkweed every day and to keep all of the poop out of their cage to keep it clean. And uh, they're pretty self-sufficient and you get to hatch butterflies out right at home. You'll find you'll need lots of milkweed as the, as they're getting, as the caterpillars are growing from their first instar to their fifth instar. And then you can see at the top, the top photo there is our, the little setup we have in a, in a uh, butterfly that's just emerged from its chrysalids. And then a couple, further right that have already emerged, maybe the day before, and then a few uh, further right that are still in their chrysalis. Mm -hmm. And if you get really into it and you want to start tagging monarch butterflies, you can actually order tags, um, little stickers. It's pictured on the far right there. Evie's got a butterfly with a tag on it from an organization called Monarch Watch, if you just Google that. And you can order little tiny sticker tags. And in the fall, you can put those sticker tags on the butterfly and release them. And if they find your butterfly in Mexico, they'll give you a call. And I think we have a, we have a slide a little bit later on with okay. some more info there. The really um, interesting thing, of, um, so that happens in most butterflies. They go through instars in or stages as caterpillars uh, and they emerge. But most caterpillars overwinter here in some form um, or another. Uh, and a few, like the monarch butterfly, migrate. And this is, of course, what... Um, the monarch butterfly is, you know, really famous for, is that they go through several stages um, during the spring and summer. Uh, they move north. Females uh, move. Females in 
arrive in Texas, lay eggs, and then the next generation moves further north and then lays eggs, and then the next generation moves further north until they reach Ontario and um, other parts of southern Canada. That last generation that's born uh, um, migrates down to Mexico and overwinters as, as adults. And this is when in September, uh, we see monarchs moving south uh, en masse, and then uh, they eventually, they travel a few thousand kilometers down to Mexico, the oil mill fir forests in, um, in central Mexico. And they form these huge congregations of millions and millions of butterflies. And in fact, from a scientific, um, from a scientific point of view, the overwintering location, the overwintering location, was known in Mexico for a long, long time, but not to scientists until the 1970s. It wasn't um, discovered by scientists, Western scientists, till the 1970s. And that the, the bottom left shows uh, the cover photo of National Geographic when the uh, the overwintering colonies were discovered. So there's a lot that we know about monarchs, and there's a lot that we don't really know um, about them. We know where they overwinter. We know that they take multiple generations during the summer to reach Ontario and Southern Canada. Um, but there were still like a lot of mysteries going on um, to this amazing complex migration. Um, the other thing we should, I should note is that there's another migration going kind of parallel to the one that we see in Eastern North America. There's one going on in, uh, in Western North America, mainly in California and Oregon and Washington, where those butterflies overwinter on the coast, the Pacific coast. We were really interested, one study I wanna tell you about is, um, we were really interested in fall migration and how far monarchs travel, um, what kind of cues they use from the environment when they do migrate. And one way we addressed this was putting on little tiny radio transmitters onto monarchs. Um, and they're small uh, 250 milligram transmitters that we attached, we just glued on the, the monarch and we tracked them using these towers. It's called the MODIS wildlife tracking system. Um, and the towers, the location of the towers are all there on the map on, on the bottom. And the, we have some towers in the Georgian Bay area too that, you've, that we put up. Um, and the location of the towers, if a monarch flies past or near the tower, we can pick it up and um, we know that it's migrated to that spot. And a recent study we did picked up, we tracked darners, uh, green darners, dragonflies and monarchs. And we found that monarchs can travel up to 150 kilometers a day and uh, at a rate of about 35 kilometers an hour, up to 35 kilometers an hour. And that's with <laughs> the wind though. <laughs> they can't do that on their own. Um, they like to migrate, not surprisingly, on warm days. Um, and when the winds are at their back, so they can migrate with the wind, wind assisted. Um, so we were able to track, and we're, we're continuing to do this, uh, track monarchs uh, throughout southern Ontario and into the U.S. as well. When they uh, go down to Mexico, now Jessica's been down to, I've been down to Mexico uh, a couple of times. Jessica's been down several times. Uh, maybe Jessica wants to talk about what happens down there. Sure. So the fascinating thing about uh, where the monarchs overwinter is that geographically, it's pr a pretty small area. Um, the Monarch Butterfly Reserve in Mexico is quite large to encompass a large area, but all of the colonies usually um, fall within an area that's less than 12 hectares. And depending on the size of the wintering colony each year, it may only be a few hectares uh, in size. And when they get there, they only go to the very high altitude forests of the oil mile fir, where oil mile fir, a specific tree species, is prominent at about 2,500 meters above sea level. Um, so there are these really large uh, conifer forests and the butterflies, as you can see in the top left there, will congregate all together on these oil mile fir trees. And at that elevation, it's the perfect combination of temperature and humidity uh, to allow them to slow their metabolic rate down um, and just enter a form um, basically of hibernation where they're inactive for the winter period. 
Uh, it never, well, ideally it never goes below zero. It hovers just kind of above zero because they're not tolerant to freezing. If it does drop below zero, which it does sometimes, then you get a large die off of butterflies. Um, and then in about, uh, they, they will stay there totally inactive, usually for the months of late December, January, and early February. And then they start to kind of wake up and think about starting to migrate back north. Uh, while they're there, they're reproductively inactive. So they're not, um, when they're overwintering, they're not mating or feeding at all. Uh, it's not till the later parts of the year that they start to think about maybe drinking some nectar, drinking some water, um, and maybe finding a mate. So one thing um, that we didn't really have a good idea of um, on the science side is where all these monarchs were coming from. We knew that they were coming from, you know, large area, eastern North American mountains and the Atlantic, but we didn't know the specific areas that they were coming from. So when uh, we can't radio track all of these monarchs um, because the radio transmitters are too small and they don't last that long. So one thing we did was track them chemically with chemical markers. And the reason we did that is because the tagging, although it's fun and it's a great activity for citizen scientists and kids to participate in, uh, rarely leads to recoveries on the wintering grounds. So we can tag a monarch in Ontario and sometimes we find them in the millions and millions of monarchs in Mexico, but very rarely do we. So we found, they found a couple, um, and I still encourage you to do this, to tag monarchs, absolutely. It's tons of fun. It doesn't hurt the monarch. You put a little tag on, uh, on the wing, and that's my daughter, Evelyn, um, after we've tagged a monarch in Kitchener-Waterloo. And um, maybe it'll be recovered, but usually, usually it isn't. It's, like, it's a needle in a haystack. One in 1,000. One in 1,000. Well, that's actually not too it's bad. Not bad. It's better than lottery odds. Yes. And Southern Ontario actually has quite a high recovery rate compared to a lot of other locations. Now, we, uh, we developed a uh, method in which every single monarch we, we sampled on the wintering grounds, we could estimate where it came from. Didn't matter if it had a tag on it or not. And the way we did that was using something called uh, isotope ratios. And I'm not gonna talk about what isotope ratios are. They're a chemical marker, but all you have to know is you are what you eat. This is my daughter a few years ago um, eating some cookies. Now, if I take the chemical signature of the cookie um, and I, then I take a chem chemical signature of my daughter, it should reflect that she's eaten cookies. And if I take even a hair sample three months later of my daughter, um, I can tell that she ate cookies three months prior. Um, that's because hair grows, and once it grows, there's, it's, it, chemically it's an in, inert, it doesn't change. So the hair, will, the hair will grow and reflect at the time of the hair, the hair grew of what the individual was eating. And that's exactly what we do with monarchs. Monarchs are raised, all, all monarchs are raised on milkweed, they, that milkweed has a certain signature of where that milkweed was grown and the caterpillar incorporates it, it turns into a butterfly, and then that butterfly can fly down to Mexico and carry that signature with it. And we can sample that wing up to 10 months later or even longer and estimate where it came from. And that's what we did in this study. And we sampled monarchs in Mexico over many, many years and estimated the proportions of where they came from in, in Eastern North America. You can see in the Midwest, uh, that most monarchs came from the Midwest region, but quite a few, 17% came, came from Ontario in, in, the, in the North Central area. And uh, a little bit fewer came from the Southern parts. That, what that says is the, produ the really productive areas late in the breeding season are, tend to be a little bit further north, and that's where most of the overwintering monarchs are born. Jessica um, leads tours down to Mexico, and she's just going to tell you a, a little bit about what that's like. Sure, and I'll just show you some photos to give you a, a visual idea here. This is a little town uh, called Angangueo and it's in central Mexico in a, a mountainous valley between two of the wintering colonies. So the wintering colonies are at the tops of the mountains. So in these areas of Mexico, um, there are small little um, villages or ejidos uh, where the people uh, basically sustain themselves 
uh, on an economy surrounded by tourism related to the monarch butterflies. So if you visit the colonies, there's usually a little um, village base at the base of each colony where you can get a horse ride, um, you can get some food, you can buy some souvenirs, and then you can go up to the wintering colonies. Now, all of those dark clusters that you see at the tops of those trees, those are actually masses of thousands of butterflies that are just dripping from the trees. Um, and sometimes those colonies on those trees can be so heavy, they actually break the branches of the trees. That's what it looks like up close. You can see that they're all snuggled in there. And interestingly, oil mile fir trees actually have special little notches in the, the pine needles that allow the butterflies to hook on with their little tarsus or what a butterfly hand is and hold on really tightly so that they don't fall off. These pictures are taken in late February when the butterflies start to get a little more active. You can see that they're open on the trunks of the trees, sunning themselves, fly around a bit. They often will leave and come back. This is butterflies um, puddling. So when butterflies, any butterfly species congregates uh, to drink water on the ground, it's called a puddle party. These monarchs are having a puddle party. And you can see they're starting to drink some nectar as well. Um, you know, they, they build their fat reserves up before they migrate and during their migration. And then they basically live off those fat reserves while they're in Mexico overwintering for several months. So um, those fat reserves are very depleted in the spring, but they do need to start flying north as well. This is what it looks like when the butterflies become very active. They're getting ready to migrate back to, to Canada and the US. The sky is just covered in beautiful, beautiful monarch butterflies. Hmm. And so we, <clears throat> we, now that we've kind of explained, I've explained a couple studies, Jessica's um, talked about the wintering grounds and the life cycle a little bit. And so we're happy to take um, any questions uh, about anything related to monarchs uh, that you might have. Should I hand it over to you, Janet? Thanks, Ryan and Jessica. It'll go um, over to Sarah. So if you have questions, feel free. You can unmute yourself now and ask your question or type it into the chat box if you prefer that way and I can read them aloud. Do you want me to stop sharing my screen? Um, whatever you prefer. Okay. That might be easier, I think. Okay. Okay, we've got first question here. This from Jeff. This time last year we had many caterpillars on our milkweed. This year we haven't seen them. Have they already passed? Um no, they haven't passed yet. Um they haven't started migrating yet. Uh, it'll be soon. Um, the reason why you saw many more last year is because there was higher numbers last year than this year. The way that this entire population, the size of the entire population is estimated is down on the wintering grounds. And because it's the only time where all of the individuals are together. And every year uh, they estimate the size of the monarch population. They actually do it by area covered on the trees, not counting individual butterflies. But this year, so those estimates are released around February of every year, and this year was lower than uh, the previous year. And also the conditions in the spring, this spring when they started migrating north, um, weren't as good as the previous year. So that's why we're seeing fewer butterflies. Everybody's seeing fewer monarchs this year than last. Those, the numbers um, overall over, over the last few years have gone down, um, but they tend to fluctuate. They don't tend to go down kind of in a, in a straight linear fashion. They go up, up, up and down, up and down. Overall, it's been down, but it fluctuates quite a bit from year to year. All right, thanks. Um, Suzanne is wondering, how can you tell a male from a female monarch? Jessica, why don't you take that one? <laughs> I wish I had one of my specimens here. Um, that's a really good question. So if you look at a monarch butterfly, um, the hind wings, so the bottom wings when you're looking at a butterfly when it's open, if it has two black dots on the wings, that means it's a male butterfly. Those are scent glands. And in, in female butterflies, those are absent. And I guess the veins too, the veins are a little bit, in females are a little bit thicker than males but yeah. you need to have them kind of side I would by look side. For the dots. Yeah. 
look for the dots. <laughs> All right, thanks. Um, Barbara says that she's raising monarchs and she's wondering if the butterflies she raises in Hamilton are migrator butterflies or generation four? That's a good question. So uh, what is the date right now? I, it is about August 22nd. 20, 22nd. Um, so there's probably going to be one more generation, I would say. Sometimes depending on weather conditions, um, and they might start moving a little bit early, but it's still a little bit early. Usually in Southern Ontario around Hamilton, um, I would say the next generation. So early to late September, we right. start migrating. But if you had eggs and or early instar caterpillars, that would be a migratory generation. If you had a fifth instar caterpillar now, it would be probably be too early. Yeah. Okay, and Kelly is wondering, um, she says, we have so much milkweed around our house, but we never see monarch caterpillars. Are we doing something wrong? We don't use any pesticides. Uh, no, you're not wrong. Um, I'm, I'm going to assume it's common milkweed. Um, it, it could be that no monarchs have found your milkweed yet, uh, or there could be other factors that they're, you know, are playing in there in terms of predators or. Um, mm, yeah, it, it. I mean, are you? Is it, was it last year that you had very few monarchs too? I'd be surprised. Um, she said she's never had Never milk. had milk. Yeah. Oh, that's unusual. Especially the last year with such high numbers. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> but it could, the, the other thing too is that there, if there is a lot of predators in that patch for some reason, you could be getting eggs and they're just getting predated before maybe any produce. Usually a few will squeak through, but um, there's a very high mortality rate uh, in, in butterflies in general, and like less than 10% of eggs that are laid will actually make it to be an adult butterfly. So. Yeah, and Barbara's, Barbara's saying she needs to add more nectar flowers to attract them. Yeah, yeah it's true. excellent. Yeah. True, very true. Um, okay, one more question here. How small are the monarch eggs? Mm. Um, do, you have, do you have a... I don't, I don't have an actual two millimeters? size. Yeah, very tiny. One to two millimeters, I think. <clears throat> but um, they're like a silverish color, usually when they're laid. So if you, and they're usually on the underside of um, the milkweed leaf or on the very fresh little leaflets that are just about to leaf out. So if you flip over the leaf and it's green, uh, it's usually pretty obvious. Uh, if you have a search image in your mind of, of that silver color, you can usually find them pretty easily. Female monarchs that are laying eggs are very smart. They like to lay they like to lay eggs on younger milkweed. And if you, if you think about it, it makes sense. You're, you're laying at a time when the milkweed is growing and getting bigger um, and will still, will, will not senesce the, the plant. So by the time the caterpillar's in its fifth instar, there'll be a maximum amount of, of food available for it. That's really interesting. Um, are there any more questions from the group? Don't see any more here. Are these questions coming from kids too, or mainly adults? <laughs> I am not sure. Um, <laughs> kids probably I probably know everything. Already. <laughs> everyone. Um, thank you so much, Ryan and Jessica. This is really great. And thank you to everyone who joined us today. I hope you all learned something about monarchs. Thanks so much. Thanks for having us. Thank you.